Hey everybody, welcome to Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain. Got a great show for you tonight. Before we dive in and get started, go ahead and chime in and let me know where you're tuning in from. And if you're new to the Dr. Osborne show, uh, let us know again uh, where you're tuning in from in the world and we are going to get started here. If you've got questions, go ahead and try to start plugging those into the feed. We'll get as many answered as we can tonight. As always, we uh, rarely have time to answer them all. We're going to be talking tonight about all things thyroid related. So we'll start off with this is one of the most commonly diagnosed conditions in the United States today. Low thyroidism, now or hypothyroidism, sometimes often t also referred to in its autoimmune cousin form as Hashimoto's thyroiditis. Again, so you can have hypothyroidism and you can have an autoimmune form of low thyroid or hypothyroidism. You can also have an autoimmune form of too strong of thyroid function, meaning hyperthyroidism, but tonight we're going to be focusing predominantly on low thyroid. So I wanted to dive in with to talk a little bit about some of the different types of reasons why the thyroid hormone itself or thyroid production can be interfered with or can be hindered because this is something that most doctors don't talk to patients about. Uh, actually, it's, in my experience, it's quite rare. Most of the time when people come to see me, they've gotten, you know, their other doctors have diagnosed them with low thyroid. They've put them on thyroid medication. They haven't really um, told them why they have low thyroid. And I think fundamentally, if we're going to understand this, if you've got that hypothyroid connotation, then you should know why. You should at least know what are some of the reasons why. And if doctors would do their due diligence, a lot of times they would actually be able to measure for these whys that we're going to be talking about tonight. So we're going to be talking about, so stay with me, we're going to be talking about four triggers, four very little discussed triggers for a why your thyroid might be under functioning. So again, if you're new to the Dr. Osborne show and you don't know much uh, about our message about our about what functional medicine actually is, stay tuned. We're going to dive into that and kind of give you some great information about that. Now, before we get started in any deeper, I'd like to poll you guys. How many of you have a diagnosis of hypothyroidism. So how many of you tuning in tonight have either been told by your doctor or your thyroid's not working properly, you have hypothyroidism? Uh, if you do, just type in hypothyroid in the comment section below and, and uh, drop me a note. I'd like to know how many of you are actually struggling and dealing with this as we, as we go through it. So I'm gonna pop a slide up for you. We're gonna talk about a couple of different major triggers for low thyroid that, again, like I said earlier, very rarely get discussed when you visit your doctor's office. So what you're looking at here in this research study is um, kind of a synopsis or a summary of some things, but there are two chemicals, BPA and perchlorate, uh, per perchlorates, that are compounds oftentimes known to create endocrine dysfunction. They're thyroid disrupting chemicals. And this is uh, this has actually been shown in a number of different studies. Now, if you're not familiar with BPA, uh, this is oftentimes found in plastics, right? It's one of the compounds in plastics that creates the plastic elasticity. So it's one of the ingredients in plastic that makes the plastic pliable. So the harder the plastic, the less BPA, um, the greater degrees of plasticity, the greater degrees of BPA. So like a lot of those water bottles that many people drink out of that contain BPA. Now I know what you're thinking, maybe they've, they've gone to BPA-free water bottles that are still plastic. I want you to understand that bisphenol A is not the only thyroid disrupting chemical. We actually know that it's not just BPA, it's bisphenol as a rule of thumb, it's bisphenols that can do this. So it doesn't just have to be limited to BPA. So even if it's a BPA-free water bottle, if you're drinking out of plastics on a regular basis, know that that can circle back around and bite your thyroid and create disruption. There are a number of studies that have shown that BPA and bisphenol chemicals can actually disrupt the way iodine is taken up into your thyroid. Now, those of you that don't know, when your doctor measures your thyroid, a lot of times, one of, the, one of the things they're going to measure is T4 and understand that the 4 
is iodine. And iodine has to be transported into your thyroid gland. And part of the way it's transported is through something called an NIS synporter or a transporter. And what happens with BPA is BPA makes it harder for that iodine to be taken into your thyroid gland. So again, you want to be aware that if you're drinking out of plastics, eating off of plastics, eating out of plastics, using plastic aggressively for your cooking products, etc., storing your food in plastics, not a good idea. You want to use glass, you want to use ceramic, you want to use something other than plastics um, to avoid getting exposure to these chemicals. Now, bisphenol chemicals can also be found very commonly in cosmetics, and so those. this is one of the reasons why we say who is most affected or impacted with a low thyroid, we know that it is women, right? Women are disproportionately affected with a low thyroid and with low thyroid function. And, you know, there's suspicion that one of the reasons why is this right here. With the endocrine disrupting chemicals in cosmetics and plastics, women typically use more cosmetics than men, obviously. And so that in and of itself is one of those increased risk factors or one of those increased components. So if you're, again, using a lot of plastics, no, it can increase hypothyroid problems by reducing your thyroid gland's ability to bring in iodine. And of course, iodine deficiency is notorious for causing low thyroid. But we also have perchlorates, and these perchlorates are commonly found in things like jet fuel. Now, not that, you know, if you're not working on a runway where you're being exposed to massive quantities of jet fuel, then your biggest exposure is really just the pollution, the generalized pollution from day to day. But we also get um, perchlorates in fertilizers. So again, if you're doing your own gardening and using some of these chemical fertilizers, they can contain perchlorates as well, also known to impact and affect thyroid hormone. And so again, two chemicals that you could be getting exposure to on a semi-frequent basis or regular basis. And if you're struggling with hypothyroidism, and your doctor hasn't had a conversation about why you should put the plastic water bottles down, why you should reevaluate BPAs and other bisphenols in your cosmetics. Um, and, and potentially here, you know, you can't stop the jets from flying and not unless there's COVID-19 ravaging the world. <laughs> but um, what you can do is you can filter your air and you can filter your water to minimize the exposure that you get from water and air runoff. Same thing with fertilizers. We have a lot of chemical fertilizers that farmers use today and those things get into the water, they find themselves in the water table. And so filtering your air and filtering your water become very, very critical. So the key message here is, again, don't use plastics and filter air and filter your water. Um, now there are a couple different types of filters that I would recommend if you really wanna be accurate at getting these things out. Don't use a cheap refrigerator carbon filter or like your, your pitcher filters that are, again, those fit, pitchered filters are generally cheap carbon that won't pull a lot of this stuff out. You wanna use something like a reverse osmosis filter to get this done. So um, if we need to, those of you, we can put up a couple of links for, um, for quality products that are designed to filter some of these chemicals out a little bit more aggressively than just your standard refrigerator filter because that's just not going to cut it. So those are two chemicals. Now I want to throw up the next slide here. Let's throw up um, the next study. Yep, that's it. So on another, I call it a chemical, but even though it's found in food and that's your, your sucralose. Now we're going to talk about sucralose is, you know, oftentimes no, well, not oftentimes, is known under its trade name Splenda. Sucralose is chlorinated sugar. And so chlorinated sugar, there have been a the study here, this research study that I've got up on the screen for you is, is actually one where doctors actually had a case study of a woman whose hypothyroid was actually induced as a result of aggressive consumption of Splenda on a regular basis. So if you're, if you're a big fan of these artificial sweeteners, particularly Splenda, the chlorinated sugar version, one of the reasons why this is a problem is, is, is iodine. Iodine is also known as a halide. And halides are a, um, they're a grouping, if you ever studied chemistry in school and you remember the periodic table of elements, there's a grouping on the periodic table of elements called halides and that includes iodine and another compound called bromine 
and it also includes chlorine, and it includes fluoride. So these are all considered halides, right? So halides are these four agents together. And so going back to this research study on Splenda and sucralose, chlorinated sugar, the chlorine, okay, as I mentioned here, chlorine is a halide. Understand that these three, bromine, chlorine, and fluoride, compete for uptake. So they compete with iodine to get into your thyroid gland. And so if you, if you have a diet or if you have um, an environment that's very rich in bromine, chlorine, and fluoride, then you can increase um, your risk of developing low thyroid by iodine inhibition. So in essence, you prevent iodine from properly being taken up by your thyroid because these three are competing with it. Now, sucralose or Splenda or chlorinated sugar, again, that's one of the reasons why it does that. Now, we can get chlorine too from drinking water, which goes back to what I said earlier, filter your water. If you're trying to avoid a thyroid problem, realize that chlorine is in your drinking water. And for many cities, bromine is also in your drinking water. And guess what else is in your drinking water if you live uh, in the city and the water is being fluoridated, especially in the United States. Now, not so much in Europe, but in the US, and that's fluoride. The, the water is fluoridated. And some of you actually go out and take the effort to buy fluoridated water, in my opinion, which is a very, very bad idea. So you want to avoid overexposure to these things. Generally speaking, people get bromine when they eat bread-based products, when they eat flour. Flour, oftentimes your, your flours, your processed flours are brominated. It's a, bromine is a dough conditioner. So we can get overexposure to bromine through flour. You can get overexposure to bromine through pesticides. You can get overexposure to chlorine through drinking water, but also through pesticides. Same thing with fluoride. You can get it through drinking water. You can also get it through pesticide exposure. Fluoride is also found in toothpaste and mouthwash. It can also be found in tea and tea leaves. And that's you know green tea, black tea, or white teas. Not so much herbal teas, but um, green tea, black tea, or white tea. So fluoride is, a, is a commonly found, and I've seen, I've actually had people come in to see me where they were drinking, you know, five, six cups of tea a day, and the fluoride levels were through the roof, and they had hypothyroidism, and we had to get the tea out of their, out of their diet in order to really allow that iodine to get back into the thyroid. Now, from this perspective, I would say, what, what can we walk away from? We can walk away knowing that we can filter these things, but we can also walk away knowing that sucralose, which is an artificial sugar, which is designed as a calorie-free type of sweetener to prevent uh, blood sugar spikes and diabetes, which we actually know it doesn't do. It actually doesn't prevent blood sugar spikes or, or it doesn't improve overall blood sugar uh, regulation. So it's a bad idea to use it. It's an even more bad idea to use it if you have hypo hypothyroidism because again it competes with iodine uptake into that thyroid gland. So we've got, let me show you a picture of that here. Let's throw up the next slide here on, uh, on the sucralose itself. You can see this, what you're looking at in this slide is you're looking at um, on the top uh, versus the bottom, you're looking at sugar versus chlorinated sugar or sucralose. And so what you can see on that top in that molecule is it's, it's sucralose substitutes a chlorine, a couple of chlorine molecules for hydroxyl molecules, and that's what makes it different. It's supposed to create a scenario where you can't absorb, uh, absorb the sugar, so then it becomes calorie free. But again, you can absorb those chlorines just fine into your body. They do go in. So if you look, let's pick up the next slide. I want to show you another one on this. So what you can see here again, I, I mentioned the halides, chlorine, bromine, and fluoride, and then iodine as well. So I think it's important that you, that you kind of, again, understand where chlorine can play a role in that. So let's scroll down through these. Uh, I've got a few more for you. I, so, so again, we've got so far, we've got bisphenols, we've got perchlorates, we've got Splenda. Now let's talk a little bit about, okay, I've just told you to be careful of tea and now most of you are probably gonna start cussing me in your mind. Let's talk about coffee. Now, I want to be real careful when I say that um, coffee is not, necessarily, and is not necessarily dangerous to everybody uh, who, has, who has an issue. 
uh, with their thyroid. But there's some research studies that show a couple different things that I want you to understand. Number one, coffee reduces the uptake. So if you're on thyroid medication, it reduces the uptake of the thyroid meds. So if you're taking a medication, know that coffee can interfere with the effectiveness of your medication. Um, number two, coffee can mimic gluten. Now, in that regard, some people have a problem or an issue with coffee as it, because they're gluten sensitive. And so there's this molecular mimicry or this cross reactivity that can occur where in some instances for some people, coffee, the elements or the proteins in coffee can actually look like gluten. And so for some people, remember that one of the causes of low thyroid is gluten. And so let's pull up that slide as well because I want you to see that. So coffee and gluten can look similar to, you know, to your body and so that can trigger a, a, a potential problem. But if you look here, so what we've got, in, there are a couple different studies I want to show you. And that number one, in this study here, you can see the presence of anti-gliadin antibodies in people with autoimmune thyroid disease. Where gluten's claim to fame is in terms of causing thyroid problems is in the autoimmune thyroid disease, so Hashimoto's. So gluten is known to contribute to Hashimoto's disease. A, a number of research studies that have shown those with gluten antibodies with Hashimoto's. And then we got another research study here for you that says that gluten consumption can elevate inflammatory antibodies for up to six months and that it doesn't take a whole lot of gluten consumption to do that. So if that's the first time you're ever hearing this, and I know you probably haven't been listening to me for very long, um, and maybe you haven't read No Grain, No Pain, but you know when, when I say No Grain, No Pain, I'm not just talking about physical pain in your joints or muscles. I'm talking about the, the pain of hormonal disease like thyroid, like a low thyroid, which causes fatigue and hair loss and weight gain and lethargy and depression, um, among other things. It can also cause muscle pain, and that's that hormonal pain, so to speak, where you have gluten-induced autoimmunity that can really, really wreak havoc overall in your body. So these are some of your predominant, we talked into a doctor and he says, hey, Mrs. Jones, you have low thyroid. There's two questions that you wanna take this information, there's two questions you wanna walk away asking. Number one, is my low thyroid autoimmune? So, is it autoimmune? In essence, is it Hashimoto's, okay? So ask that question, it's a very important de delineation because there's two predominant kinds of, of low thyroid and one of them is autoimmune, okay? And all of these things that we're looking at here, except for sucralose, everything here has been shown to contribute to autoimmune thyroid disease, whereas sucralose has been shown to contribute to nutritionally low thyroid because iodine is a nutrient. So again, it's important that you ask, is my thyroid condition autoimmune or nutritional? Now, I'll promise you this. If you ask your doctor if your thyroid condition is nutritional, he'll probably laugh at you and tell you that, that thyroid and nutrition have nothing to do with each other. And if that is the answer, then you definitely want to pick up your, your bag and walk out of the room and find another doctor as quickly as possible because they very, very much have everything to do with each other. I'm going to explain that next in part two of this breakdown, of this fundamental breakdown on thyroid for you. So part one was, what are the triggers? What are the things that could cause it? Bisphenols, perchlorates, sucralose, coffee, gluten cross-reactivity. These are very, very common things. Again, this is not, this is not intended to be an all-inclusive list of all the things that we know can cause low thyroid, but it's intended to give you some information that you can go have an intelligent conversation with your doctor and get deeper answers. So the next thing I wanna to talk to you about is I wanna to talk to you about nutritional. So Autoimmune, autoimmune low thyroid is generally caused as a result of primary triggers. Those triggers are, as we said just now, chemicals. And these are not the only chemicals, but they're very common chemicals. Um, chemicals can cause it. Food can cause autoimmune disease, autoimmune thyroid disease. Microbial imbalance, back, abnormal bacteria, yeast overgrowth, things of that nature we know can cause autoimmune thyroid disease. 
And then the, the fourth trigger, which is more nutritional, um, meaning that it's, it's not necessarily going to trigger autoimmunity, but it is going to trigger low thyroid. So what's the difference? So if we look at nutritional thyroid, it's important to understand that um, in your brain, so I'm a, I'm a pretty terrible artist, so we're just going to draw a picture of a head here. Okay, so in your brain, you have your pituitary gland. And so in your pituitary gland, part of its job is to send a message to your thyroid gland. So the pituitary sends a message to your thyroid gland and asks your thyroid gland to produce T4. T4 is what I was talking about a moment ago. So the pituitary gland produces TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone. And that, that's, again, it does what it says it does. It stimulates your thyroid to produce thyroid hormone. T4 is inactive. And the best analogy I can give you with this is that T4 is like having a Ferrari in your driveway without the keys to start it. It's really fancy, really fast, but it doesn't go anywhere unless you activate it. So the T4 has to be activated. And so we activate that T4 inside of our body by converting it to T3. Although we can also make a substance called reverse T3. T3 is the active thyroid hormone. So this one is active. Reverse T3 is also inactive, doesn't work, doesn't do much for your metabolism. It has about one one thousandth of the activity as your active thyroid hormone. And once this happens, T3 is the active form that communicates to your cell. It communicates to the DNA inside of your cell. So it talks to your DNA through a receptor on the surface of your cell nucleus. And, uh, and so kind of the way this works. So again, this is why it's not as simple as your doctors made it out to be. Most doctors will measure this TSH. Docs measure TSH. And this is a lot of times how the, how the diagnosis is, is. If your TSH is high, Okay, so if it's, if it's high, then they tell you you have low thyroid. If it's low, they tell you you have high thyroid. And, and again, TSH, the more of it you make, what that's saying is the more you make, the more you're trying to get your thyroid to stimulate the production of T4. That's why if it's measuring high, we say you have low thyroid hormone, okay? So it can get confusing, so I don't want you to get confused. But most doctors, this is all they'll measure. They'll measure TSH and they'll base the whole diagnosis on one element. Now, what I'm gonna fill in is the gaps for you here because I want you, again, I want you to be able to have an interactive, intelligent conversation if you've had this diagnosis so that you can, you know, so that you can push through without, um, without walking out of that office confused and on medicine for the rest of your life when it might not be necessary. So the TSH, in order for your body to be able to produce TSH and regulate the production of TSH, that requires vitamin B12. Okay, that's why nutrition, that's why I said nutritional. Is it autoimmune or is it nutritional? This is a nutrient. This is a nutrient your body can't sustain normal function without. You require vitamin B12 to produce TSH. You also require magnesium. Okay, so we need these two very critical nutrients to properly be able to manage the production of TSH. Now, once that happens, that TSH travels to the thyroid gland and it asks the thyroid gland to produce T4. Well, what's T4 made out of? Remember I said earlier that the four is iodine. It represents how much iodine? Well, iodine's a, a nutrient. The T is also a nutrient. The T stands for tyrosine, which is an amino acid that you get from eating food. Predominantly tyrosine amino acids come in protein. So um, again, protein, protein-based foods are gonna contain higher quantities of tyrosine. You're gonna need to get iodine. Iodine predominantly in our diets comes from seafood uh, because there's not a whole lot left in the soil due to soil erosion and other factors. So tyrosine and iodine produce your T4. Now, it, it doesn't just, it, it just doesn't, you don't just have tyrosine and iodine and magically they connect. There are other vitamins that help that connection and one of them is vitamin C. So vitamin C and vitamin B2 help 
combine tyrosine and iodine to form that T4. So, okay, we're, we're halfway through this process. We've already got B12, magnesium, vitamin C, vitamin B2, tyrosine, and iodine. That's six nutrients that are already mandatory required for us just to get to this. This is the inactive form of thyroid hormone. So we need six nutrients to get to the inactive form and we haven't even begun with this process yet. So, so again, now we have to convert this T4 into T3 hopefully. And that process, this conversion process, it requires iron and it requires a mineral called selenium. Okay, uh, selenium runs an enzyme system called a diiodinase enzyme. Diiodinase, if we kind of deconstruct that word, diiodinase means to take away an iodine. That's why it goes from T4 to T3. So that selenium helps in that process. So now we've added two new nutrients, iron and selenium, to get to T3. Now we have an active form of thyroid hormone, but it still, it still has to communicate to your DNA. Okay, thyroid hormone has to communicate to your DNA. It, does, it doesn't just magically improve or speed up your metabolism. So to communicate to the DNA, that requires vitamin D, but it also requires vitamin A. So these two nutrients help to form uh, an antenna on the surface of the nucleus of a cell that bind T3 so that T3 can talk to the DNA because when T3 talks to the DNA what happens now is an increase in your metabolism and that's why people that don't have enough thyroid have low or slow metabolisms and they have a tendency, although this isn't always 100% true, some people actually are very thin when they get a diagnosis of low thyroid, but a lot of people can gain weight. So it can go either way. You can, you can actually be very thin, but a lot of people will gain weight because they have a slower metabolism or they will be very slow to heal. They won't grow hair very effectively. Their nails will become thin and brittle. The skin will become thinner and more dry. Their energy will be uh, diminished. They'll have a lot of brain fog or brain fatigue or trouble recalling words. These are symptoms of the metabolism not being up to par or up to speed. And so again, this is what I mean by nutritional low thyroid. We've got B12, we've got magnesium, B, vitamin C, vitamin B2, tyrosine, iodine, iron, selenium, vitamin D, vitamin A, all necessary. We can add another one here, and that's omega-3 fatty acids, because to drive that metabolism after the fact of thyroid talking to the DNA requires omega-3 fatty acids. So if you don't eat a lot of cold water fish, um, and you're and you're not really into um, like if you're vegetarian and you don't eat a lot of meat, it's, it can be very challenging to get adequate quantities of omega-3 fatty acids in the diet. And so again, these nutrients are all necessary to get to what we're trying to do, which is me increase metabolism. And remember what metabolism is. A lot of people are very confused. Metabolism doesn't mean the speed at which you lose weight. It's not what, what metabolism is. Metabolism is the sum of two things. So metabolism equals catabolism plus anabolism. If these are new words for you, catabolism, these are chemical reactions that break things down. Break down, and, and I'll, I'll come back to that in just a minute, where anabolic or anabolism is chemical reactions that build. Remember that your body is in constant breaking down and building mode. So the sum of the, the quantity of how much you break down old tissue to replace it with new tissue, this is anabolic response and catabolic response. They kind of teeter-totter or seesaw back and forth. If you only had reactions that were building, you'd get cancer and, and you'd die. If you only had reactions that would break you down, your body would dwindle away to nothing. So there's a balance. When you have old skin cells, 
you know, your skin's brand new every, about every 28 days. So what happens? How do we get rid of old skin cells? Well, we have catabolic reactions that break those old cells down. And then we have anabolic reactions that help to come in and build new skin cells. And that's why when we have a slower metabolism, we actually slow down the body's ability to heal. And it's not just skin. Remember, you know, your red blood cells are brand new every three months, your white blood cells every six months, your gut's brand new every two to seven days. So different tissues have different kind of rates of metabolic turnover. But if you have low thyroid, that rate of metabolic turnover suffers and this doesn't work as effectively. And so we can, again, we, we are delayed in our capacity to heal and, and things just kind of slow down and don't work quite as well. So we're more prone to injury. We're more prone to exercise intolerance. More, we're more prone to um, easy bruising and things of that nature. But our body also won't, again, it won't repair at the rate that we need it to repair. Old cells won't break down properly so that we can make new cells. And that means those old cells have to hang out a lot longer and do the job of young cells. It'd be kind of think of it like this. It's, it would be like asking an 80 year old person to do the job of a 20 year old person. It's not quite the same. That 20 year old is generally gonna have more energy and more elasticity than that 80 year old person. So we want our cells as they live their life cycles to break down appropriately so that we can replace them with new ones. Otherwise, what happens again is our body ceases to properly repair itself. So again, going, going back to where we started this conversation, I said that there were things that could cause low thyroid and many of those were chemicals, although we did talk about gluten and we did talk about coffee as being a potential trigger. Of course, there are other triggers beyond those even, but some triggers cause an autoimmune process some cause a nutritional process. These are the nutrients involved in proper thyroid metabolism, but the autoimmune process is a little bit different. The autoimmune process is when you produce antibodies that attack your thyroid hormone. So antibodies that either attack your ability to produce thyroid hormone, so they attack up here in this area, or they actually attack the actual hormone itself. And in some research is showing that there are antibodies that can attack the receptors for the hormone. So you've got you know, antibodies that can attack your ability to make them, antibodies that can attack the actual hormone, and antibodies that attack the actual receptor binding sites for the hormone. This is autoimmune thyroid disease. And again, the primary triggers of autoimmune thyroid disease uh, outside of uh, those chemicals we discussed are foods, food reactivity. And the biggest one, the most well-researched one as it relates to your thyroid is gluten, which again is why I keep referring you back to No Grain, No Pain if you haven't read that. So that's the breakdown that I wanted to share with you. Now, if you think gluten might be a problem, maybe you're new to the show, maybe you've never gone on a gluten-free diet or don't even really know much about a gluten-free diet, underneath this video, and. Um, and, and so depending on whether you're watching it live or whether you're watching it, uh, you know, when it replays, um, I'm going to put in the, in the comments box below this video, I'm going to put a link to a quiz that you can take to help you to determine whether or not going gluten free might be a smart move for you to make to help with your thyroid function. Um, and, and so other beyond that, we'll put a quiz up in the live or a link to the quiz up in the live feed as well. So those of you watching live can access that quiz and take it and see whether or not you know there's a potential that a gluten-free diet might be helpful for your thyroid condition but this is especially true remember gluten can cause thyroid disease in two ways it can cause the autoimmune piece okay but gluten can also damage your intestinal lining and what happens when it damages your intestinal lining is it causes malnutrition the number one deficiency for people with gluten sensitivity is iron deficiency. The number two deficiency is vitamin B12. So we know two of the major nutrients responsible for proper thyroid metabolism can be diminished as a result of gluten-induced gastrointestinal damage. So gluten can cause the antibodies, but it can also cause the malnutrition that leads to nutritional hypothyroidism. And in my experience, I've seen people have both. They have hypothyroid caused by autoimmunity, but they also have nutritional hypothyroidism. And this is why the medicines don't help them very well, because you can take the medicine, you can take the artificial T4, like you know, the levothyroxine, 
okay? And it's not going to help you if you can't convert levothyroxine because you're selenium or iron deficient. If you can't convert it to T3 and then subsequently vitamin A, vitamin D, omega-3, then you may not feel better being on that medication. This is why some preparations of thyroid medication are actually T3 preparations. But even if you're taking T3, it still doesn't solve the vitamin D, the vitamin A, or the omega-3 fatty acid problem if you have those deficiencies. So again, in my experience, most people that have a thyroid issue don't just have an autoimmune issue with their thyroid. They also have a nutritional issue with their thyroid as well. So all that being said, I'm going to go ahead and open it up for any of your questions that you might have. Let's try to keep them to thyroid-related topics if we can. Okay, so let's see here. Wow, lots of you uh, chiming in that you do have uh, thyroid issues. We got folks from all over uh, the globe. Washington, Milwaukee, Boston, Vancouver, Canada, the UK. Let's see here. Let's dive into some questions. Okay, what supplements are good for preventing metabolic alkalosis? You don't really need supplements to prevent metabolic alkalosis. You just need the right food. If you're, if you're really um, trying to prevent, well, so, well, first of all, if you're saying metabolic alkalosis, that's not, in, or lower pH, it's actually not accurate. Metabolic alkalosis would be a higher pH. Um, met metabolic acidosis would be a lower pH. So maybe reword your question. I can get an answer for you. Uh, let's see here. Is autoimmune really just a food and environmental sensitivity? No, there's four triggers for autoimmune disease as I mentioned earlier. So trigger number one is food. So in that regard, yeah, it's big time food. Trigger number two are chemical exposures. Trigger number three is microbial imbalance. And trigger number four is nutritional deficit. Now we can throw in a fifth trigger, uh, which is you know, which is stress that doesn't go away or stress that's not uh, mitigated or relegated properly. Um, as a fifth trigger, but those four are the four primary, what we call primary chemical triggers for autoimmunity. And yes, it, it, it is that simple, unfortunately. Again, most doctors won't even entertain measuring those things. They'll just simply put you on medication for the rest of your life and tell you um, to accept it as your fate. And I would just say question and challenge that fate because it doesn't make sense to accept something um, that, to accept something that, that doesn't get properly investigated. Love this. Um, got my TPO down. TPO is thyroid peroxidase. It's a type of thyroid antibody. Uh, from more than 1,000 down to 117. Got my TSH optimized, but my low free T3 and free T4 have not budged despite all the positive changes, diet, subs, lifestyle, everything. Any ideas other than meds? Yeah, test. Um, if you haven't done the testing for these different things, you can take supplements. But again, if you're not objectifying whether or not these nutrient levels are low, you may never get to optimal T4 or T3 because the supplements you're using may not be high enough doses, may not be strong enough, may not be absorbing very well. So, so a lot of those things will play a role and, and play a factor in it. So if you're just kind of doing over-the-counter supplementation, my advice to you would be ask your doctor to test you more specifically for these different nutrients. Okay, Angeline, I have a thyroid nodule five centimeters on the left side, how to shrink it. Doctor wants to take my thyroid out while biopsy was benign, meaning non-cancerous. I am not ready for surgery, please help. Look, it's, Angeline, I, I can't give you medical advice on whether you should or shouldn't follow that doctor's advice, but I could say that sounds, in my opinion, like it's a pretty aggressive recommendation. Um, if, if they're wanting to remove it and it's benign and you haven't tried this approach, I would, again, I would get with that doctor and have them measure all of these different components. If you're not already on a gluten-free diet, if, you're not, uh, if you haven't had a, a good uh, food allergy panel measure, measuring the different food sensitivities that you might have, like those are all things that I would suggest that you do right away. I mean, the, the first thing that you could do is pick up a copy of No Grain, No Pain and just follow the phase one and phase two diet and do that for 30 days. And, and if, again, if you're not already following a gluten-free diet, you might see some reduction in the size of that goiter. It wouldn't surprise me just in 30 days to see some improvements. Let's see. <laughs> yeah, so... 
Um, somebody says, I actually did work on the runway. So that jet fuel being a very big reality for you then, yeah, I mean, I definitely consider that to be a, a big problem. Um, let's see. What lab offers the best self-order blood or stool food sensitivity test? Um, to my knowledge, any of the ones that you can self-order are not all that um, are not all that great. I don't really recommend that you spend the money on them. My advice would be get with a good functional medicine practitioner um, and get guidance in that way because the testing is only as good as the lab or the methodology of the lab. And so if you get the right test, like let's say you go to your doctor and he orders a vitamin B12 test, but if he uses a serum test, you know, that's, to talk about all the different lab testing involved with this is, is too onerous of a conversation to have tonight. But again, giving you one example, B12 serum can come back, oftentimes it comes back false normal or even in some cases false high, even though it's actually low. And so the wrong test could lead you down the wrong road really quickly. So don't recommend guessing at it. Recommend getting professional help in that regard if you're struggling. Um, which teas contain fluoride? All teas that are green, black, or white teas. So if it, it comes from your traditional black tea leaf, uh, which white tea does, green tea does, then it could potentially contain fluoride. The reason why a lot of teas contain fluoride is because tea is really good at pulling fluoride out of the soil. So the older the tea leaf, the stronger the levels of fluoride within the tea. Now there's a company that, that I recommend that produces tea from very early leaf. So if you're a big fan of drinking tea, uh, maybe we can pop that link up in the feed for you on, um, on, on the, the company that we recommend that people, if you're gonna buy tea, use this tea. Let's see here. Lost half my hair, uh, six millimeter nodule, extremely dry skin. How to reverse these issues? Again, I, I'll just I'll just reiterate what I've already said. You can you can start if you're at home doing it on your own. You can start with no grain, no pain, phase one, phase two diets. It gets you through 30 days, and you can see if there's any results in that way. But getting my advice, if you've got a thyroid issue and your doctor hasn't told you why, there's a strong likelihood that you are gluten sensitive. That's just been my experience with people. Um, gluten sensitivity, one of the predominant causes that I see of thyroid disruption or thyroid dysfunction uh, beyond these other chemicals. But again, testing to see what it is that's causing your thyroid condition versus guessing or just throwing some supplements at it and hoping that it, that it uh, works well enough to give you some type of improvement. Let's see, Karen says, I have MS, um, don't use any dairy or gluten, collagen comes from dairy. Will that affect me like dairy, which gives me brain fog? It might, I would be cautious about you know, that's weird that you're taking a collagen that comes from dairy. I've not seen that on the market. Most collagens come from either beef, fish, or chicken in my, um, in my analysis. So you might just recheck that. It's pretty easy to get collagen from other sources. I have, a, I have a product called Ultra Collagen with no dairy that you might want to try if you can't find one without dairy. How can we tell if it's autoimmune? Yeah, that's the one question I didn't answer. It's a great question, Lisa. So here's the caveat. This is a blood test that you can have done. It's called a TPO. So TPO, and any doctor can order this blood test. It's not a special test. TPO stands for thyroid peroxidase or thyroperoxidase. It's a type of antibody. Another test is called an anti thyroglobulin antibody test. So these two will tell you if you have an autoimmune issue. Now, there's a caveat to this. You can come back and not have positive antibodies, but still have autoimmune thyroid disease. Although oftentimes the antibodies are positive, you can come back with what's known as a false, you know, false result. So another thing that some doctors will run is they'll do an ultrasound on your thyroid and they'll look for signs of nodular inflammation in the thyroid, which can also be indicative of an autoimmune thyroid problem. So when you combine, kind of combine these three things together, 
you get the best, most accurate picture as to whether or not what you're struggling with is an actual autoimmune problem versus just a pure, purely a nutritional problem. So TPO, antithyroglobulin, and an ultrasound of the thyroid can be very helpful for a doctor in, in helping you get a diagnosis of Hashimoto's. Let's see here. Iodine makes my Hashis flare up. Maybe a smaller dose is okay. So iodine is one of those, it's, it can be tricky. So first and foremost, I don't recommend that people take higher doses of iodine, even though you need iodine to make the four, right, to make the, the, the four molecules of iodine go into forming your thyroid hormone. If you have high levels of antibodies, so again, if, if your TPO is greater than 100, so if it's 100 or higher, I don't recommend just blatantly taking iodine without knowing whether or not you need iodine. And with your thyroglobulin antibodies, if you're really 20 or greater, I, d I don't recommend it there either. Now, that being said, um, one of the things you can do is you can actually test your iodine levels to see whether or not they're low. And the best way to assess iodine is something called a loading test, a pre and post load. So doing a loading test for iodine, asking your doctor to run a loading test for iodine can become very important. Now the other thing here is um, when you're testing iodine, you should also test the halides as a grouping. So getting your bromine tested, getting your fluoride tested is also important because you may have normal iodine, but if you have high levels of fluoride, then how do we get rid of the fluoride? Well, one, we quit taking it in. We, we don't drink the teas that are contaminated with fluoride. We don't use the fluoridated toothpaste or mouthwash. We filter the fluoride from our water. But sometimes that fluoride continues to be persistent and hangs around anyway. And so sometimes taking iodine is how we actually detoxify from too much fluoride. But if you're finding that, again, that taking iodine flares up your Hashimoto's, it's one, going to be one of those things where you want to control your diet to get these antibody levels down well enough before you make an attempt at using higher doses of iodine. That's a common thing that is you know, one of those clinically relevant things. I don't recommend higher doses of iodine unless you're being managed, unless you've got a good doctor managing that iodine because there's, there's too many nuances and there can be some, some symptoms or situations that can occur that make you think you're allergic to iodine or make you think that you're actually reacting to iodine and it may not even actually be that. And so working with somebody who's experienced can become important if you're trying to really truly get this thing navigated. Okay, let's see here. How long does it take to bring down antibodies, um, to bring gluten antibody levels down? My gliadin, anti, uh, my gliadin um, antibodies, anti-gliadin antibodies, IgA level is over 320, and my gliadin anti, uh, globulin antibody Ig. You, you, that's got to be a misquote there in IgB because you don't make IgB antibodies. You might, you might mean IgG is over 160. It doesn't take a year. In my experience, it takes, if you're really solid with your diet, you're going to see dr dramatic drops in gluten antibodies within uh, two to four months. Now, it takes at least two months to get the gluten out of your system completely, but that doesn't mean we won't start seeing the antibody levels start to drop. So again, it... it, it can happen within a matter of months. It doesn't take a year. Um, and so again, you can ask your doctor to remeasure them uh, as you're going through the process of diet change. There is a rumor iodine is not recommended for Hashi. Uh, again, rumors and speculation and, and experience. Some people don't do well with iodine that have Hashi's. That's, that's, you know, that's, that's, true sometimes it's just not we can't make a blanket statement and say everyone with Hashi should not take iodine because iodine is an essential nutrient and saying that uh, without testing for whether or not your levels are adequate is in my opinion uh, it's shortchanging you and it could lead to greater degrees of problems I've seen low levels of iodine perpetuate thyroid disease um, not not necessarily flare somebody up but actually perpetuate the illness um, let's see here I love this. Lori says, diagnose, change my life, change my diet. No gluten, no dairy, no caffeine, no corn, no processed sugar. TSH went from 12 down to 3.5 without medication. 
Love it. Thanks for sharing, Lori. Um, I read sardines are rich in vitamin D and omega-3. Yes, they are. Sardines are a great source of, uh, of both of those. What's the danger? Angeline wants to know, what's the danger of having high selenium without supplementing or eating Brazil nuts? My blood selenium levels are always, is always high. You might be being exposed to some type of chemical-based selenium, like a selenium sulfide. Um, oftentimes, the anti-dandruff shampoos. You know, if you if you've got an issue with your skin, you might be absorbing too much in that in that way, and that could be potentiating that. But I would I would look for chemical derivatives that that also contain selenium that might be driving up your selenium levels too high, especially if you're not supplementing or just eating a massive quantity of something like chard. Red chard contains a lot of selenium, and Brazil nuts can contain a lot of selenium, and it doesn't take much to create an elevation. Uh, Jennifer wants to know, how can I increase iodine without flaring my Hashimoto's? Again, if you're trying to increase your iodine, one is to start on really, really, really low amounts and just kind of slowly work it your way in. But again, my, my, the best advice I could, I could say would be get with your doc and have your levels measured and see whether or not that's, that's actually something you need to do. Um, could I possibly be drinking too much tea? I take it for health, ashwagandha, astragalus, lemon balm, and pa de arco. You know, yeah, you can drink too much of anything, but that type of tea, if you're talking about ashwagandha, astragalus, lemon balm, that doesn't, that's not where you're going to get exposure to the fluoride. The tea that you're going to get exposure to fluoride with is going to be more, again, your green tea, your white tea, and your black teas. Let's see here. If you are low on iron, does the body prioritize it for the production of red blood cells first and other non or other iron dependent processes suffer or is it different for every person? In my experience, Kelly, it's different for different people. Um, you know, I, I've seen cases where the body does prioritize for iron production where we'll see, we'll, we'll measure and we'll know their iron is low, but they are producing adequate quantities of hemoglobin. So again, a lot of doctors will diagnose iron deficiency by whether or not you make adequate hemoglobin and whether or not your hematocrit is low. Um, but I've seen cases where a person's still iron deficient, even though they have normal hemoglobin and hematocrit and normal mean corpuscular volume. So yeah, it can, but it doesn't always. Um, Elizabeth wants to know, is the problem really gluten or could it be phytic acid? Um, so phytic acid is a, is a nutrient in plants that prevents mineral absorption. So in that regard, yeah, I mean, too much phytic acid can cause mineral problems. But it is gluten. So the question was, is it gluten or is it phytic acid? Um, it is gluten. The studies are very, very clear on gluten-inducing autoimmune thyroid antibodies. So we know it's the gluten. Because phytic acid doesn't cause uh, doesn't doesn't cause gluten antibodies to elevate uh, concomitantly with with thyroid antibodies. Phytic acid is more of a of a mineral binding agent that can prevent minerals from being properly absorbed. And of course, if we're talking about some of these minerals that I've that I've discussed today, then could it contribute to nutritional hypothyroid? Sure, it could, but not so much autoimmune. Um, Oh, Victoria wants to know if the antibodies are antithyroglobulin versus TPO, is there a significance to that? No, not really. You make one or the other. It's just that the antibodies are unique to where your body is forming the attack or making the attack, but is there a significance? No, both of them mean that you have a hype or an autoimmune thyroid issue that has to be resolved, meaning you have to go back in with your doc and investigate what those triggers for your autoimmune disease are. Are hair tests for food intolerance is valid? No, throw them in the garbage. Don't ever buy a hair test for food intolerance. It's a ridiculous notion. Um, throw them in the garbage. They're not worth the, not, the report's not worth the paper it's printed on. Okay, let's see here. So Jody wants to know, what about my teeth without fluoride? Um, understand that your teeth to be hard and to have good enamel don't need fluoride. Fluoride is not is not an essential nutrient that your teeth need. Fluoride chemically hardens the enamel, which is why dentists like to use it. 
Um, but it doesn't, it's actually not an essential nutrient that your body has to have to produce enamel. So uh, you got to be very clear about that. Fluoride, in my opinion, is a very toxic substance. I just don't recommend anybody you know, fluoridate their water. Most countries don't. I think the U.S. in the modern world is really the only country um, that, that still does water fluoridation because we know fluoride's a neurotoxin. We know it damages brain cells. We know it creates and contributes to autoimmunity and other health issues. So um, if, you're, if you're in that realm of, of belief that fluoride is somehow important for dental health, um, I would encourage you to, to dig a little bit deeper and get a little bit more educated about that. My serum iodine was 42. Um, again, I wouldn't recommend testing iodine or any nutrient for that matter in just in pure serum because it's a, when you use serum as a measure to determine deficiency, it, um, it can be very misleading based on your current diet. Serum is a reflection of your last meal for the most part. And remember, your nutritional status is not a reflection of your last meal. Your nutritional status is a reflection of your last 100 meals over time, compounded over time. So if you really want to get accurate, you need to have a functional assessment test done or an intracellular test done that gives you a longer window of your nutritional status more than just the last 24 hours. I like that. Don says, I was 100% gluten-free, dairy-free, sugar-free, felt great. Then I lost my way and started eating what I wanted to. Um, I have Hashimoto's, but now I have severe diverticulitis. Yeah, I mean, you got it. Thanks for chiming in, and maybe this episode today, Don, will be the thing that kind of pushes you back in the right direction. Remember, the cardinal rule of nutrition is you can't get healthy eating food that's not healthy. And so that may be a little bit different for different people. We can all pretty much say that sugar is not good for us. Processed sugar and processed chemicals are not good for us. Beyond that, it's pretty unique from one person to the next. But um, once you go on a healthy diet, you want to stay there. It's not a temporary thing. Uh, Melissa wants to know, do you have to heal your gut before taking iodine? No, you don't. Remember, the part of healing your gut is what you eat. See, a lot of doctors say, heal the gut first, heal the gut first, heal the gut first. Um, and that, that's fine. You, you want to heal the gut. But how, par, how do we heal the gut? It's part of it is what we put in our mouth. 60% of the nutrition that helps your gut heal comes directly from your food, not from the blood supply. So remember, the vast majority of nutrients that help your gut heal come from what you put in your mouth, not from your systemic blood supply. Uh, let's see here. How can we deal with the side effects of levothyroxine since it's not possible to function without it, but I can't bear the side effects either? Is there any natural replacement that does not need a prescription? Uh, well, first, the biggest problem with levothyroxine, levothyroxine contains corn. And those of you who haven't read No Grain, No Pain, and this is the first time you're hearing this, corn is a form of gluten. So if you're using levothyroxine, it, no, it's got corn, and it's per, it can perpetuate the problem. I've had a lot of people come to see me that were struggling in their thyroid, getting anywhere, getting ahead, breaking through their plateau, because they were getting persistent corn gluten exposure. And so when we, when we referred them back to their docs, and we said, look, get your, ask your doctor to compound levothyroxine without the corn. So without the grain-based fillers, and that might be where you need to look at starting. Um, if you are taking Levo and you don't, again, if you don't, um, if you're taking the regular form, it's going to have that corn in it, and that might be a big, big part of the problem. There are certainly other things that you can make an attempt to do, but if you're going to do them, it needs to be under supervision. You can take things like tyrosine, you can take adrenal glandulars and thyroid glandulars that can be very helpful, and for some people, it's enough to where they don't need levothyroxine, but again, it needs to be managed properly before you just make the attempt to do it. Uh, let's see here. Do you have any supplementation to maintain a healthy thyroid? Yeah, all this stuff, right? All these things are, are critical and important. I'd say the number one supplement you can take in all of this, just to maintain not just a healthy thyroid, but just to maintain 
who you are as a healthy person is a, a solid multivitamin, you know, very, very good, thorough, well-formulated multivitamin that will contain all of these things. It may not be that it contains all of these things in high enough amounts to overcome a deficiency, but enough to give you support on a day-to-day -day basis. So I've got two formulations there, ultra nutrients and multinutrients, both uh, are powerhouses in terms of multivitamin, multimineral formulas. Um, that I would recommend anyone anyone take just as a preventative for trying to maintain good health. Oh, great question. Cheryl wants to know, how does non-filtered water you bathe or shower with affect the thyroid? Should I filter this water as well? Yeah, you can do um, shower head filters. They make carbon KDF shower head filters. I certainly would recommend that you filter your shower and your bathing water as well. Uh, or a whole house water filtration system with carbon and KDF granules to, to, again, to filter out a lot of the toxins, chemicals, chlorine, bromine, etc. from the water. Those are both um, great filters to put in place. Um, let's see here. So Wendy says, do you have vitamins for Hashimoto's and MTHFR? Um, well, MTHFR, you know, vitamins for MTHFR, the predominant vitamin for MTHFR would just be methylated B vitamins. So like, you know, 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, methylcobalamin, and pyridoxal 5-phosphate are three of the very important uh, B vitamins necessary to help support somebody with an MTHFR mutation. And those are all part of our multivitamin formula. So if you're, again, if you're just looking for good uh, support there, you know that my multivitamin formulas contain methylated versions of, of uh, B vitamins. It'll support, you know, health in Hashimoto's and MTHFR. Yeah, so if your doctor recommended an NP thyroid without properly testing you, you might get a second opinion. That doesn't sound right to me. A doctor shouldn't be prescribing thyroid medication if they're not actually ascertaining whether or not you need it. Wanda wants to know, is the TSH level really that relevant when diagnosing hypothyroidism? It is relevant, but it, it, again, it's a piece of the puzzle. It's, using only TSH to diagnose hyperthyroidism is like, is like taking 10 pieces of a 100-piece puzzle and putting them on the table and then trying to figure out what the puzzle is and how to put those pieces together. You, yeah, you can put those particular pieces together, but it might be harder to see the complete picture. So it's important. It's just not, uh, it's just not comprehensive. And again, when it comes to health, we have to be comprehensive. When it comes especially to diagnoses where a doctor may be saying, hey, this is something you need to do for the rest of your life you better get comprehensive because otherwise you're going to be stuck on a medication that doesn't come without side effects. I, I see people all the time in my office, you know, one of the side effects to too much thyroid medication is that you're, you can have a heart attack. It can, it can overwork your heart. So if you were told take thyroid medicine and you're not properly being monitored, measured, or tested, know that you can strain and stress your heart out. A thyroid hormone is a very, very powerful drug and you don't want to take it lightly, and certainly I don't recommend anybody take it without having a thorough workup done. Okay. So Kathy says, my thyroid blood work came back normal, but I have a nodule. Can it be shrunk, and if so, how? Kathy, have them check your iodine. A lot of times, remember, <laughs> Why do we the iodize salt in the United States? So this is interesting historical fact. We iodize salt in the U.S. because of nodules. Because at the, at the turn of the century, goiters were a common problem in the U.S. Because as people gravitated away from the coast, you know, away from the East Coast, moving more uh, inland, right, settling in more, uh, we'll call them farm regions, or settling in more, you know, regions without the coastal seafood, where the iodine was the predominant part of, you know, it was rich in the, in the seafood-based diet. So people started to develop goiters in mass. This is why we have a nationwide fortification program where we add iodine to the salt. That exists because of nodules. So if you have a nodule but your thyroid numbers look good, the very first thing I would ask your doctor to run would be to effectively assess your iodine status and your halide status to make sure that your 
uh, your nodule is not being caused by something so simple as an iodine deficit. There's a lot of, remember, you got to understand too, a lot of people today have been told don't eat salt because it increases the risk for high blood pressure and heart disease. So a lot of people don't eat salt anymore. They don't, so they don't get the iodine because they also don't eat seafood. And so if you're one of those where you've cut out regular table salt in lieu of, you know, in lieu of some type of rock salt or, or um, pink salt, you know that you're not really getting any great source of iodine in that salt. And if you don't eat seafood, you could run into a problem with iodine deficiency that could cause a nodule or a goiter. And this is one of the reasons why my multis have iodine in them because so many people don't use those salts anymore uh, for fear of the, the processed salt being poor for their health, that we want to give them some degree of iodine in their diet consistently enough to try to prevent a goiter from occurring. Okay, let's see here. Um, what if you no longer have a thyroid? Is supplementation with T4 enough to restore the normal communication? I love this question, Aggie. Um, so if you don't have a thyroid and you're using T4, you better pay close attention to everything that happens after this, right? So the iron, the selenium, the D, the A, the omega-3, super critical in order to turn that T4 that you're using prescription into that T3 and to activate that metabolism. So you, you, you probably a good thing to do would ask your doctor to be, when they're measuring and monitoring your thyroid, would be to measure and monitor these nutrients simultaneously to make sure that what you're taking, because some doctors, uh, when somebody's, when, some doctors, when, when their patients have had their thyroid completely removed, um, will prescribe both a T4 and a T3 preparation. And so you might also have that conversation with your prescribing doc to see whether or not that's a smart choice or a good move for you as well. But either way you go, it needs to be monitored again. Too much thyroid can be a problem. And my experience is when people start getting this part in check, when they change their diet, when they go gluten-free and they start getting these nutrients dialed in, if they're taking thyroid medicine, a lot of times what happens is now their TSH drops below 0.5. So that TSH, if it's low, remember I said earlier, if it's high, you have a low thyroid, but if it's low, then you're taking too much thyroid. So you have a high thyroid and that is what increases the risk of heart problems. So again, if you're on a thyroid medication, you know my advice would be at least every six months, your doctor should be checking you to make sure, especially if you're changing your diet, doing the no grain, no pain diet protocol, because I get people sometimes pay attention to these symptoms. So if you have heart palpitations, if you, if you start developing anxiety, if you start having sweats or hot flashes, if you're having trouble getting to sleep at night, if you become a bear and you're super irritable and you have no patience, like these are all things that might mean that your thyroid medication is becoming too strong as you change your diet. And so don't, don't think that if you're changing your diet, don't think that the change in your diet might be causing those things. If you're also on thyroid, look, look at that medicine first and make sure you're not getting a toxic amount. Um, Kathy wants to know, my B12 level is very high, over 1,200. Are there side effects? Not really. Serum, it's a serum level. If it's over 1,200, you're having your B12 and your serum measured. And that, again, that's not a really super accurate way to measure vitamin B12. Um, nobody's ever died from a B12 toxicity. Nobody's ever been hospitalized or made sick by a B12 toxicity, at least not in the reported literature. That doesn't mean you can't have a problem, but I would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't make me suspect that you have a major issue even, even if your level is that high. Um, let's see, Denise says, after radiation for hyperthyroid, are there special things that we can do? So if you've had your thyroid completely radiated and now you're on a medication to maintain and modulate your thyroid, you still want to, again, going back to what kind of medicine is it? Is it T4, T3 preparation? The nutritional aspect becomes very important. And remember, if you had to have your thyroid radiated because you had hyperthyroidism or Graves' disease, Guess what else causes, so when we talked about gluten earlier, gluten can cause Graves' disease. Gluten can also cause Hashimoto's. It's, it's kind of the flip side of the coin. So you can have autoimmune hyperthyroid for the same reason you can have autoimmune hypothyroid. And it's important to know that because many people, again, it's not a conversation a lot of doctors have. I can't tell you how many people I've seen that had that hyperthyroid diagnosis and they were taking very powerful medications to suppress their thyroid's um, 
and not doing so well until we actually started to change their diet. That diet change is one of the most important, one of the most critical things that you can do above anything else, including supplementation. Diet comes first. Diet is more critical than anything else. All right, folks, I think we've gone well over our time tonight, so questions haven't stopped coming, but make sure you tune back in next week and make sure you share this show with a family member. Um, if you enjoyed what we talk about and what we teach here, help me save lives. Hashtag save 100 million lives. That's our goal at, at, uh, at, at drpeterosborne.com and, and glutenfreesociety.org is to get more information like this out to the masses. So also, I'm going to put up behind this video a couple of other videos. You, you'll see them up here in the corner. We'll put a couple of other videos up on thyroid. So those of you who still had questions, you might find some additional answers in some of these other videos on thyroid. And, and again, if you, if you didn't click on that link below, I'll put that link below to the quiz that you can take um, to determine whether or not going gluten-free might help you with your thyroid problem. This is Dr. Osborne wishing you excellent health. We'll see you next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Time. Have a great week. Hey, don't forget to tune in next week, same time, 6 p.m. Central Standard Time for another Pick Dr. Osborne's Brain show. Bring all your toughest health questions to me. I look forward to answering them. And before you leave today, make sure you hit subscribe, and once you do, click that bell. That bell is gonna allow us to remind you right before we go live, but it's also gonna allow us to remind you when we come out with other video content all week long. We've got lots of episodes coming your way all week long, and I don't want you to miss anything. So again, subscribe, hit that bell, so that you can get notified when we have that new information put up for you. Thanks so much, and I'm wishing you excellent health, have a great week. We'll see you next Monday night.